Oh, 
Son, who else invites me to call him Father, only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only, cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Again. Good morning. morning. Gotta wake you up. Got up a late night. Just checking. Uh, it is good to see you here this morning. We are glad you are here. If you're visiting with us, again, we are super glad that you're here and uh, we're honored that you came to visit today. If you are looking for a church home, some place to come to work, this is a great place to be at home. Uh, and if you're interested in that, please see one of the ministers or one of the elders. One of us can point them out to you if you don't know who they are. Uh, Wayne's lesson today. No man is an island to himself. I've noticed watching things happen over the transpire of the last 18 months. How COVID has pulled us apart. It's it's created this whole standoffish that, quite frankly, is hard to deal with. It's necessary, but it's hard to deal with. It seems to isolate us. And really, truly, God did not want us isolated. That's why he gave us the church. That's why he gave us his son to pull us together as one body, one family. So Wayne's lesson today will be focusing on that and how important the fellowship is when we come together, not only in worship, but at other times. Angry words, oh let them never from the tongue of bridal slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them every soul the live. Love one Father's blessed come 
Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we're so grateful for today and for the blessings that you provided for us. We come before you humbly, and Lord, we pray that we always operate out of a place of love and that we always strive to do your will. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins and that you watch over and protect us. We ask that you bless this congregation, that you allow it to continue to grow, not only in number, but in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray that everything we do today is pleasing in your sight and that you be with those of our congregation who have lost loved ones and those who are sick. And Lord, please bless each of the members and the families that are represented here today. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice and your son and everything that that means to us. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, draws each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand on my As we gather around the table this morning, let us focus on the words of the psalmist in Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord in the righteousness. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, and you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord for the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. 
I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call in the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Let us give thanks for the sacrifice on the cross. Our Heavenly Father, as brothers and sisters, we gather at your throne at this time to pay homage, to give thanks for the mighty sacrifice of your Son, for whom sacrifice we're able to one day spend eternity with you. And it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne once more to acknowledge the power of the blood of your Son and its ever-cleansing power to rid your children of their sins, their inequities, their failings, their unholiness that one day through the power of that blood, we may stand before you blameless, pure, and holy, and able to enter into your midst for eternity. And we thank you for the power of that gift. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we remember the times when we used to pass a plate around and we used to take up a collection for the work here of this congregation. Of course, as we know, there are baskets upon the entrance, and of course, we can give digitally through our mobile app and those types of things. But let us focus on the work that we do with those funds and the opportunity to give back a portion of what he's bestowed upon us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters and all those in attendance here today for the, work that is, for the work that is done in your name here in the Smyrna area and around the world because of the, the labors and because of the intentional planning and because of the time and energy that goes in as a sacrifice that we have for everything that you've given to us. Please accept the tokens that we give back to you that your name may be spread throughout the land and the, power of the son, and the power of your son and the power he has to save that we can spread the good news each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. It's time for children's worship hour. So if you're three years old in second grade, make your way there now. Part of my papers. I have to wing it. Turn around and look, so excuse me if I do. We're going to sing a couple of old songs that we haven't sung in a long time, probably several years. These are all standards talking about the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Cleanse by his blood, join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. How oh, I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around him. It's because we're a family. And these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in its victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been 
as we travel this side for a part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From ranks unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joined hands with Jesus as we travel this sod. For a part of the family, the family of God. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. God's family. And though some go before us, we'll all Just inside the city, as we enter in, there'll be no more party, for Jesus will be together forever, God's family. Sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we sit together, heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to God's family. Good morning. morning. I'm so glad that you're here today. And if you're visiting with us, we are doubly honored that you've come to worship with us and join us. And as Mark said earlier, if you're looking for a place to worship and to work, this would be a great place for you. We would love to have you be a part of our family. And that's what we're talking about today is being a part of God's family And I've always known how special it is because I just, I love the church. I love this congregation of God's people. And I love meeting people in in God's family all over the world. And just about everywhere you go, you can find somebody that is a believer that's in the family of God. But recently, since my diagnosis, I have have really seen in in practical ways that the family of God is, is so important and so supportive I can't tell you already how many cards I've received. Um, got, I got one yesterday in the mail. I have no idea who this person is. <laughs> it, it had a return address. It's in Murfreesboro somewhere. Somebody heard about it and just sent a very sweet card. I could tell that she was a believer by what she wrote in the card. And, and that just said to me 
how special it is to be a part of the family of God right now in this place, and, and especially with this pandemic that is, seems to be rearing its head um, even higher than it has been in the past few months, and we're concerned about that, and we know that you are as well, and we're going to keep watching that, and you're going to keep watching that, and, and let's just all try and be safe. Um, I have surgery coming up on Tuesday, so uh, I purposefully came in a little late. I'm going to leave a little early. I just can't afford to get sick before Tuesday. Um, after that, you can hug me, kiss me, do whatever you want to do, but, but until then, I've got, I've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, but it's true that this pandemic has isolated us. I mean, for a while, we were told, stay in your home. And our worship services were called off. And then after a little while, we were able to come back together on a limited basis. But still, we had to have the social distancing. And, and you really couldn't shake hands with anybody or hug anybody. Or, you, you know, we would do the fist pump and then immediately run and, and wash the fist. And we've just, we've just been isolated from one another. And Mark is exactly right. It's not the way God created it. And it's not ideal. I do think it's necessary. And I do think we've done the best we can to try and keep people safe and at the same time maintain this fellowship, this family that we have together. And we have become very creative, quite honestly, in continuing and building our relationships with one another in a non-ordinary way. I think more people are sending out cards. There are more phone calls that are going out that there's more reaching out in different ways than face-to-face and and flesh-to-flesh, shaking the hand uh, or hugging. And and so it's encouraging to see that we are striving to keep this up. But that's not everybody. Some people have taken advantage of this. Maybe that's the wrong word. Some people have kind of slipped into a mindset that says, you know what, I'm perfectly happy being alone. And I do realize that, um, that there are some folks that simply don't like being around people. And, and I get that. It's not me, but I get that there are some people like that. The danger of that in Christ and in God's family is that we lose that fellowship. We lose that connection that we have with one another. The way God designed the church. He did not design the church to be a bunch of individuals that are out there all on their own. He designed it to be a family of people that are together. That There is a poem that we are all aware of, at least the first line, and it goes like this. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We are not islands unto ourselves. God did not create us to hide out in our homes God did not create us to barricade ourselves and to separate ourselves from other people. Again, I think this has been very necessary to keep people safe, and it's not ideal. It's not what we would have chosen, and so I have complete confidence in in our eldership and in our committee that was working together um, to, to keep us safe. I support them wholeheartedly. But I just wanted to show you this graph that I came across in preparation for this lesson. And maybe it's a little hard to see, I don't know. But the the timeline is is level of social interaction. And so over here in this bottom left corner, that's as if you have no social interaction. Over in the right side, that's as if you are the social butterfly and you're out every day and you're around thousands of people. Well, as you can see over here on the left, where you have this social isolation, you have no social interaction, um, there is a risk of social isolation. There is a loneliness risk, but the 
and there's a connectivity risk. We're not connecting with one another because we have no social interaction. As you go across that, that graph of social interaction, what you find out is that these three, the social isolation, loneliness risk, connectivity risk, those get smaller, but the COVID-19 infection rate gets larger. And so we've had this, this delicate balance that we've tried to create where we don't have social isolation or loneliness or connectivity problems, but at the same time, we limit the amount of this infection and its risk to our people, its risk to our families, our friends, our loved ones. And, and let me tell you, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not into the politics of this. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what you think about the politics of this, but I know that people are dying. I see it, I hear it every day, and we've got to be cognizant of that and aware of that and to do what is right and best, but we're, we're balancing this delicate balance of trying to keep people safe and at the same time not, not face social isolation, loneliness, and connectivity issues, and quite honestly, we're balancing this so that we can continue to carry out God's purpose for our church. And so it is, it is a delicate balance. And there are some things that you're going to have to make your own decisions about. And I know we all hoped and prayed that we were past this by now, that, that this was not going to be an issue, that we were just going to continue to move forward and things were going to get better and better and better. And I still, I still have faith that that is the future. But it's not where we are today. So, I want to be sure that we understand the importance of connectivity, but also want to be sure that you understand my support of you being safe, my support of you doing what is best for you and your family, but everybody needs to be aware uh, of the dangers that are out there, both on the COVID side, but also on the loneliness, the connectivity issues that we face. Let me read you a couple of different quotes. Here's a quote from a psychologist at Stanford University. He said, I know of no more potent killer than isolation. There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and us from them. It has been shown to be a central agent in the etiology of depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, rape, suicide, mass murder, and a wide variety of disease states. I know of no more potent killer than isolation. Well, he's a psychologist, but surely he's aware that there are people out there that have cancer. That's a pretty potent killer. Surely he's aware there are people out there that have heart attacks and, and, and heart issues. That kills people every day. There are people that have strokes, and, and they're dying every day. He knows all of that, but he's still willing to say that isolation is one of the more potent killers because of the destruction that it does to our physical and mental health. So we've got to be careful about that and at the same time balance that and try and be safe in where we are. Chuck Swindoll in his book, Strengthening Your Grip, he, he said this, no longer are we a share and share alike people. We are independent cogs in a complex corporate structure. We wear headsets as we jog and do our lawns or walk to class or eat in cafeterias. Our watchword is privacy. Our commitments are short-term. I think the last part of that is pretty telling. Our watchword is privacy. Now, I, I agree that we all should expect and receive a certain amount of privacy. And your level of privacy needs may be different from mine. I know that there are a lot of people that they don't like to talk about when they're sick. That's fine. I would much rather be the opposite and just put it out there and let everybody know that I'm sick and have people praying for me. That, that's me. We all have these different levels of privacy. But when the watchword becomes privacy and, and we think that privacy and being isolated, even if it's with a small group, is more important than being a part of the whole family of God, then that's a problem. That's an issue that we need to deal with. And then he says, our commitments are short-term. I've noticed that, that, that we, have, 
we have begun to shun long-term commitments because we don't know what the world is going to be. I mean, we don't, we don't want to lay down a couple of thousand dollars for a vacation in, in November because we don't know what the world's going to look like in November. We don't want to make these long-term commitments. We want everything to be short-term contracts, if you will, because we are worried about the future and we like, some people have fallen into a desire to have this privacy, isolation, stay at home, stay away from people. I, I, just, want to, I just want you to look at the, the word involvement. This is the definition of it. The factor condition of being involved with or participating in something. K- Kelly wears a lot of hats. He's going to wear a lot more hats for the next six weeks. I, I, God bless him. He is, um, he's preaching today in Williamson County um, for Bill Bryan. And I, I'm so excited to hear how this goes because he, he, I was out there, I don't know, two or three months ago. There's about 25 people. And it was so refreshing to me to be amongst those people. Zach, you were out there last week, right? Wonderful, beautiful people, aren't they? And, and Kelly's there today. And Kelly's going to be preaching for you guys for the next six weeks at least. Um, and, and I just, I, I love what he does. But primarily, he came to us to be the involvement minister. He's done a fantastic job at that and so much more. I mean, he's just, he's such a, an important part of our family here. But he wants everybody in this church, everybody in this family to be involved. And there's the definition of it, participating in something. You don't have to be the leader. You, you don't have to be the out front person. If you want to be, he can use you. But just participate, just being a part of it. And again, this is a delicate balance today with what we're dealing with in COVID and how closely we participate, how much we participate. But but don't misunderstand. We are still called to be part of the family. We're still called to be involved in one another's lives. Now, there are four areas that I see where Christians must be involved. Uh, The first one is with God. I mean, that that kind of goes without saying, right? We're supposed to be involved with God. We're supposed to have a relationship with God. You may may have privacy issues, but let me tell you something. God's all in your business, okay? God knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly what you're thinking. He knows where you are, when you're there, what you say, how you say it, to whom you say it. I mean, God's all in your business. Don't, Don't try the privacy thing with God. It doesn't work. All things are are naked and apparent before his eyes. He sees it all. He knows it all. And so we, we are commanded. It is part of our DNA, I think, as believers especially. It's part of our DNA to have an involvement with God. The second is with people in our families. I, I don't think there's the, the only greater heartache than people not being close to their family is them not being close to God. I think, some, I think they go together. To me, if you are involved with God, you're going to be involved with your family because God demands that, commands that, and, uh, and, and tells us how to do that. But it's sad, isn't it, when, when somebody is estranged from their family? I mean, we all, we all know it. We all know families where they haven't spoken together in years. Um, I, I just recently, I was, my mother was telling me about somebody that dies I don't know if your mother or father are still alive at 90, but, but mine sees the need to call me every day to read the obituaries out of the paper to me. Just, you know, death's kind of on her mind, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah, when I, when, I, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I started to quit, quit calling and tell me how many people died yesterday. I don't really need to know. But she was telling me about this friend of hers that died, and they had a child that they hadn't spoken to in 20-something years. They knew where they were, some of the family contacted them and said, hey, your mom died. And the response was, so what? How does that change my life from yesterday? I haven't, haven't talked to her in 25 years. Why would I be concerned about that? Do, do we see how sad that is? Can we not see how sad that is and how many families are in that situation? And it may be you, and my heart breaks for you if that is the situation that you're in with your family. But, but these are, I think these are must areas of involvement. We've got, to, we've got to 
be the bigger person, if you will, regardless of what caused it, and, and, and reach out and try and bring our families back together again. And that is also important within our church families. Number three is with other Christians. We need to be involved with other Christians. They encourage us. They walk with us. They put their arms around us. Let me tell you something. I, I, I have already, I told somebody this week, I've already learned so much about God and how he works and, and how important it is to be a part of the family since my diagnosis. I mean, it, it just, it changes everything to know that I, I literally have thousands of people around the world that are sending me messages, praying for me, telling me that they're walking with me in this process, call them if there's anything that we need. I mean, I, I just can't tell you how important that is to be involved with other Christians. In this other area, you may or may not agree with. I, I think it's important that be, we be involved with non-Christians. I don't, I don't know how we're going to share the gospel message to the lost if we're not involved with them. And I do think that the world has gotten to a place today where it's going to be difficult to reach people and to have, a, to have an impact in their lives if you don't have a relationship with them. And, and so Kim and I, were, we took a trip this, this past weekend just to get away before uh, my surgery and we were in New Orleans, and we, we love the food there, by the way. Fantastic. I mean, we had a, we had a great trip. But at, at one point, we're walking down Canal Street. If you've been there, it's the main street in New Orleans. And, and this guy's standing out on the street corner, and he's preaching. And, and um, you know, God bless him. I, I didn't think his message was particularly effective, but, but he was preaching. But I noticed that nobody's listening. You know, I, I think the days of standing on the street corner preaching with a microphone are probably gone. You've got to have a relationship with somebody. And so if you're going to share Jesus, you're going to have to have some relationships with non-Christians, unbelieving people. If you're going to share Jesus with people, you've got to have people in your life that are not believers. Be careful that they don't lead you and make sure you're leading them. But I still think it, these are must areas where we must be involved. And one of those is with non-Christians. But for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about number three. Our involvement with other Christians, and particularly in light of the pandemic that we're in right now. Uh, here's, here's a quote from Leslie B. B. Flynn's book, Great Church Fights, which, by the way, I didn't know existed, but I've got to get this book. To dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. To live below with saints we know, that's another story. We do have difficulty within our churches, I think, maintaining these relationships. And I guess you could say it's because we're human and we have issues with each other. Um, but you know what? That's not the way God designed the church for us to be estranged from one another, sometimes within the same room. I mean, I, I know, I don't know everything that's going on around here, but I've been around a long time and I know just about everybody in the room today, and have known many of you for a while, and I know that there are some people that sit on one side of the building because they don't want to talk to somebody that's on the other side of the building. And where in the world we ever thought that that was okay with God, I don't understand. Because it's not the way he created it. Let's go all the way back 2,000 years, day of Pentecost, the church begins, 3,000 people accept the message uh, of, the, of the saving grace of Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross. 3,000 people obey the gospel, and this is what we read about them at the end of that chapter. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Why was that important? Luke, why, why did you include the words and fellowship? Because it is important. Because it is a, a fundamental part of being in the family of God is fellowship with one another and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, that word fellowship, the Greek word, and, and you've probably heard this, is, is koinonia. Koinonia is defined as Christian fellowship or communion with God or more commonly with fellow Christians. And so we, we have this fellowship with one another. 
They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We're all about that, and we should be. This is the Word of God. We're committed to the Word of God. We're going to make our decisions based on the Word of God. We're going to worship according to the Word of God. We're going to work according to the Word of God. We're going to live life according to the Word of God. The apostles' doctrine is supremely important, but right there beside it, he says, and koinonia, fellowship, being involved with one another. Look at, look at two verses later. Now, all who believed were together. This is fellowship, guys. All who believed were together. They had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. I, for, for years, all my life, all my preaching life, I, I, I felt the need to add to that and say, now that's not commanded for all of us. But I think I'm past that point. I, I think I'm past that point. I, I'm not going to tell you it is commanded for all of us to, to live together in one big communal uh, group and to sell all of our possessions and to have it all in common. I, I'm not saying that. But we've gone too far the other way. We've gone too far the other way that says what's mine is mine. Get your, don't even look. Don't even think. I don't care how badly you're hurting. I don't care what you need. Mine is mine. You go out and make yours. That's not the way God designed it. There is a fellowship that we're living life together. And if I don't have anybody else in the world to walk with me in my struggles and my trials and, and, and tribulations in life, it should be this family. It should be this family. And, and by the way, it, you're doing it. You're doing it. You're, you're doing great. I, I'm, I am so encouraged by the prayers, the calls, the cards, the text messages, the emails. I, I, I get them all, and I love that. But I want everybody to share in that. Not just me and my family. I want everyone to share in that. All who believed were together. This was their koinonia. They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided it amongst them all as anyone had need. Four observations of their involvement. First of all, it was entered into by everyone. Three times in that passage, the word all is used. All who believed. They had all things in common. It was entered into by everyone. Number two, it held them together in times of need. Many of these people were miles away from home. They didn't have cars just to jump in and run home. They didn't want to go home. They had a newfound family in Christ. And so this idea of koinonia, fellowship, helping one another, held them together in their time of need, made sure everybody had food, clothing, and shelter and everything they needed. Number three, it, it was genuine. It wasn't forced. It was spontaneous. There is no commandment from God. As a matter of fact, eventually, the Bible tells us that God sent persecution into Jerusalem to make them go home because the idea was that they, they heard the gospel in Jerusalem, but they had to go home to share the gospel with their unbelieving friends and neighbors. And they got so accustomed to being together, eventually God sent persecution to make them disperse, but it was genuine, it was spontaneous, it was never forced. And number four, it, it added to their sense of unity and harmony. When you have that kind of fellowship, there is a certain amount of, of unity and harmony that goes along with that. And we're missing that in the church today. Do I think Highland's better than most? Yes. Could we be better? <laughs> Absolutely. We need that, that togetherness that love for one another and that fellowship. Verse 32 of Acts 4, two chapters later, then the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, koinonia, fellowship. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. I'm not sure that we're doing that, and I'm not sure, again, that it's commanded of us. I do believe that this family in particular is has a heart that says, if you have a need, we're going to fill it. If, you're going to, if you have a need, we're going to fill it. And we do our best to do that. There may be some times when it's difficult for us to meet your needs, but we're going to strive to do that. We've, we've done so many things. The Lawrence Gardner Fund, you can talk to Paul Wisdom about 
the work that goes on there. But, but we, this is our version of koinonia according to Acts 2 and Acts 4. We're trying to make sure that everybody has their needs met. Verses 34 and 35, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. All who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. That is unbelievable and, and unheard of in 2021, obviously. They distributed to each one as anyone had need. Fellowship, koinonia, God designed, God encouraged, this is what God wanted from his, from his children. Okay, quickly, why get involved? Why do you need to be involved with the family of God? Number one, God commands it. Look, look quickly at Romans 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So let's go through this quickly. Here's the Romans 12 fellowship, koinonia. Kindly affectionate to one another. How do you do that if we don't even know one another? Brotherly love. Giving preference to one another. That, that goes two ways. What that means is, uh, first of all, if, if we're trying to decide what to do, I want to do one thing, you want to do another. Because I love you, I'm going to do what you want to do, right? Right? It also goes with giving preference to one another. When, when we're out in the world doing business, if we can do business with other believers, I think that's preferable and best. We give preference to our brothers and sisters. Rejoicing in hope. You can't do that. How can I rejoice in your hope if I don't even know who you are and what's going on in your life? Patient in tribulation. Again, if I don't know, I don't know. Continuing in prayer, distributing the needs of the saints, Given to hospitality. How do we get to know one another? You spend time with one another. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. How do I do that if I don't even know you? If we're so private, and privacy is our watchword, we don't want anybody to know what's going on in our lives, how can anybody fellowship with me in that? The answer is we can't. I cannot tell you the number of times that we've been told somebody was sick weeks after they started being sick. Sometimes we didn't know until they died. And we get a phone call to do a funeral that we didn't even know the person was sick because they didn't want anybody to know and they didn't tell anybody. And quite honestly, we weren't close enough for us to know. That's simply not right. So why get involved? God commands it. Number two, why get involved? The body, which is the church, needs it. This church needs it. Every church, every congregation needs koinonia, fellowship, being involved. 1 Corinthians 12, 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body, we're talking about the church here. He's using the physical body, and, and he's making a point about the church. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, the church, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, look at this, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You are the body of Christ, but you're members individually. We're, we're a family, but we're all personally involved and responsible if we are fellowshipping the way we should. So let's, let's look at the main points here. 1 Corinthians 12, the body. 
One body, many members. This body, I have, I have ears, nose, eyes, hands, feet. The eye, hand, head, feet. One can't say to the other, I have no need of you. Because it takes all of those for the body to function properly. Paul dealt with it this way in 1 Corinthians 12. He, he said, if the whole body were an eye, where, where would be the hearing? And so if we only want to pick out certain types of people that we fellowship with, we miss out on the rest of the body. What if the whole body were an eye? You only want to associate with the eyes in the church. Well, then you can't hear and you can't smell. If the whole thing were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. He gave us all different talents. He gave us all different abilities. Guess what? He gave us all different personalities. And sometimes we find people whose personality doesn't jive with ours very well. Well, God made us all different. And it takes all of us to make the body work the way that it should. We've got to be involved. No man, God commands it. When I get involved, God commands it. The body of the church needs it. And we've got to remember that no man is an island to himself. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in a family. We live in a family. I'm, I'm going to be gone from this family for probably six weeks. I want you to be a family while I'm gone. I want you to love each other. I want you to care for each other. I want you to have fellowship with one another. I understand there's a pandemic going on. Please be careful. Be smart about the way you do things. But you know what? There's a lot of ways to be a family than face-to-face. -face. Make sure you're calling people. Make sure you're sending out the cards. Make sure you're sending text messages and, and emails and whatever it is, you, how you do your communication with people. Make sure we're encouraging others. And thank you already for the encouragement that I'm receiving and my family is receiving because of the love that you share with us. Thank you so much. We don't feel like we're an island to ourselves. We don't. We realize we're part of a family, and I am thankful to God that's the way he designed it. If we can help you in any way this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and sing this song. In the every most home. He shall sword no tent, no voice like thine.
Good morning and thank you so much uh, once again for being with us today. We have a few announcements uh, to make before we dismiss this morning. First, we sprouts. The slide says arriving this fall. Well, it has arrived. Had a great first week. Um, we are still looking for another teacher, so if you're interested in that, there are applications at the Welcome Center, but We Sprouts is off to an amazing start and so thankful for all the work that's gone into that. Um, back to School Bash for our Family Ties group. This is birth uh, through second grade. Um, it's not today anymore. We've postponed it to next Sunday. Um, so the good news is, if you forgot to sign up or weren't able to make it today, you can still sign up and come next week. So still the same plans to be here uh, right after morning services next Sunday, but looking forward to a great time with our family ties back to school bash. Again, I think I've contacted everybody that had signed up, but it's been postponed from today until next Sunday. We have an opportunity to serve um, in the, the mission field. Our Nicaragua Christian School Box uh, ministry is, is back up and running. You can stop by the Welcome Center and grab a how-to sheet, some instructions on how to participate in that. And then those need to be returned by Sunday, August 29th um, at the tables in front of the library so that those can be delivered on time. A couple of things that are not on the slides behind me. First, um, Paul Johns did have a minor stroke yesterday, and he's at Stonecrest for further testing. So please do keep Paul and his family in your prayers. And the brother Harry Anderson is with us this morning, and he gave us this information on, um, on Sister Carolyn Anderson's passing. Carolyn Clay Powell Anderson peacefully passed away on Friday, August 13th, 2021, at a live hospice in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Services will be at Woodfin Tapple Funeral Home, uh, 203 North Lowry Street in Smyrna, with visitation from 4 until 8 p.m. on August 18th. Before the service on August 19th, there will be a visitation period beginning at 9 a.m. The service begins promptly at 10 a.m. with Bill Hunter officiating. And this will all be a, also be a celebration of the 55th wedding anniversary of Harry and Carolyn. There will be a graveside service at Mount Olivet Cemetery, 1101 Lebanon Pike, Nashville, on Thursday, August 19th at 1 p.m. with again Bill Hunter officiating. That's all the announcements we have for this morning. At this time, Wes is going to come and uh, lead us in a closing prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to come here and learn more about your word and, and, and worship you. As we leave here, we ask that we can be a shining light out into the world and, and be an example uh, of you. Father, as we leave here, we ask that you bring us back to our next appointed time that we meet. Forgive us of our sins. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.